There was a landmark study that came out fairly early in the pandemic in 2020 that showed that the single most accurate predictor of outcome with acute viral infection was the status of the microbiome. And in this study, they specifically looked at the presence of a bacteria called Fecalobacterium prosnitzii. And I know you've heard me you know, wax poetic about Fecalobacterium <laughs> prosnitzii. Keep going. Also known as F. prosnitzii. It's the most prevalent bacteria in people who eat a lot of plants. Regardless of what you call yourself, if you are a good plant eater, you have a lot of F. prosnitzii. And this is super important because high levels of F. prosnitzii were very strongly correlated with good outcomes after acute infection, and low levels were associated with higher rates of respiratory distress, ICU admission, ventilation, and death. There's another bacteria, Enterococcus faecalis, a not so good one, and high levels of that were associated with a poor outcome. So here we see, you know, as much as these are complicated cascades of immune reactions, at the end of the day, we can boil it back down to what you're eating. Because we know that eating high levels of plant fiber leads to high levels of short chain fatty acids, leads to a healthy gut lining, leads to a nice Goldilocks immune response. Okay, so is the converse true, which is that if there's if plant eaters have a lot of F. prosnitzii, is it true that not plant eaters or people that choose to eat a, a more meat-based diet or a more carnivorous diet, do they have uh, lower levels of that particular bacteria and or can that negatively impact their gut function? They do, absolutely. And so, you know, the point I try to make to people is it's not so much that necessarily eating some animal protein is bad. It is that not eating enough plant fiber is really bad. So what studies, for example, like the American Gut Project study in 2018 that I know you're very familiar with showed is they looked at over 10,000 people globally in all sorts of different environments. And they found that the number of different plants you eat every week, the variety of plant food in your diet was the main predictor of the health of the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And as you recall from that study, Cyrus, the magic number was 30, right? 30. So 30 exactly. or more different plant foods results in a much more diverse, rich, healthy microbiome. And 10 or fewer was associated with, uh, you know, not so healthy microbiome. And here's a problem. I have lots of patients who tell me, oh, I'm a really good plant eater, doc. I eat vegetables every day. And it's true, but they're eating the same peas, carrots, broccoli in heavy rotation, right, for every meal. So the variety is really key. And just like diversity in the world, diversity in nature, you know, monoculture is really bad for the environment. Diversity in almost any environment you're in is important. It adds to the richness, the experience, the robustness of our societies. And it's really true with our gut bacteria, too. So if you want to have a healthy, rich microbiome, you need to eat a healthy, diverse diet full of a lot of different plants. Yeah, it's funny because I have this image in my head of rather than creating a monoculture or a monocrop where you see nothing but corn growing for miles, instead of trying to cultivate a microbiome that looks like that, you're instead trying to cultivate a rainforest. with Yeah, the jungle. We want the jungle microbiome for exactly. sure. Exactly. And, and just know, for clarity. The, the 30, correct me if I'm wrong, 30 plant, 30 different plants per week. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so for example, if you're having a bowl of oatmeal, if you're listening to this in the morning and you're having a bowl of oatmeal, you have the oats, that's one. Maybe you use some almond milk, two. You throw in some walnuts, three. Pumpkin seeds, four. Raisins, five. Blueberries, six. I like a little shredded coconut on mine, seven. You've gotten to seven with just a bowl of oatmeal. You know, maybe you munch on a carrot stick or have some celery and peanut butter. Celery and peanut butter, that's two more. Throw in a little fresh basil on your salad. So there's so many ways. When we're talking about these plants, a variety, we're not just talking about the high fiber plants necessarily because plants have these phytochemicals that are provide all kinds of incredible different nutrients. So even teas and spices are very valuable in terms of the phytochemical makeup. So it's really the variety. And there was a fantastic article that was published earlier this year looking at aging and frailty. And it found that one of the most important factors for how we age, and when they looked at frailty, they looked at things like, can you get up off the floor unassisted? Really important if you're thinking, hey, I want to be on the floor playing with my grandchildren one day. Right. Um, so they looked at frailty and aging. 
and they found that the diversity of the microbiome in older people was one of the most important indicators. So we don't want, we want to continue this. It's important early on in life when the microbiome is developing. It's important as adults. And it's important as older adults, because the more unique our microbiome as we get older, the less frailty and the healthier aging that we have. You know, I, I love to hear that uh, the three gut health experts that we have on the summit, you, Dr. Will Bolsowitz, and Dr. Ellen Desmond, all of you preach the exact same message. You just have different ways of communicating it. And, what and that we're, all, we're all great buds. I've known Will now for, we met sort of pre-pandemic, we have the same publishers, a wonderful team at Avery, Pe Correct. Penguin Random House. And they actually sent me his manuscript. They said, here's a gastroenterologist. He actually trained at Georgetown, was a resident at Georgetown when I was in attending, because he's a little bit younger. And um, we, we'd love you to take a look at the manuscript. And I read it and I immediately was like, oh, you need to put me in touch with him. We speak the same language. Yeah. And we've become great friends since then. And then I met Alan Desmond for the first time at uh, Neil Barnard's wonderful conference, uh, International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine this summer. He spoke before I did. And I was like, I was riveted because you never hear gastroenterologists. I mean, as far as I know, it's Will and I out in the wilderness. And so Alan, so we literally were like, we're starting a club. And then Alan introduced me to a couple other gastroenterologists. But we're like, how is it that, you know, there's so few gastroenterologists who are really talking about this? And, and here's here are a couple thoughts I have on that, because I think it's an important point. Yeah, please. Let's talk the, about it. Pe people ask me all the time, like, why doesn't my gastroenterologist blah, 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 blah. And I'm always saying, like, look, don't fire your gastroenterologist. Educate them a little bit. We spent three years in our gastroenterology training learning how to take care of very sick hospitalized patients who are having, you know, massive bleeding. And if we don't stop the bleeding, they're going to die. We learn how to do procedures. I myself have done about 18,000 colonoscopies, and we get really good at these procedures and taking polyps out and doing all kinds of other things. But gastroenterology is almost like a surgical subspecialty. It is considered a, a, a subspecialty of internal medicine, but because it is very procedure heavy, there's a lot of emphasis on how do you technically do these procedures. And there's not a lot of emphasis. In fact, when I was training, there was almost none on the diseases that we're now seeing, because the things that are challenging gastroenterologists now are not so much you know, massively bleeding ulcers or large polyps, those things are still important. But now we have an epidemic of increased intestinal permeability, what's known as leaky gut. We have an epidemic of non-alcoholic fatty liver. We have an epidemic of dysbiosis. So, you know, endoscopic tools are of no help in either diagnosing or treating those conditions. So you have a situation where you had this three years of training after your three years of training of internal medicine, after your four years of medical school, so that's four and three, seven years, these 10 years of training to do things that are still really important, but are also not relevant to a lot of the modern diseases that we've seen that have developed as we've become super sanitized, as our food chain has become highly pesticized, as we've been eating ultra-processed foods, the diseases have changed and the training hasn't really changed that much. And so it is, you know, we're in this really odd situation, Cyrus, where a lot of the patients actually know more than some of the physicians about these conditions. And some doctors find that really threatening. Whereas I think, you know, Alan, Will, and I find it wonderful. Like we're, like, we're always saying like, you know, most of the useful stuff we know, we learn from patients. So there's really a shift and you and I were chatting before we started taping about how a lot of this stuff that, you know, a decade ago was fringe, that now right. it's like, oh, no, we're mainstream, you're fringe. If you're still only using immunosuppressive drugs to treat diseases and not engaging your patients in a conversation about diet, you're fringe. Because, you know, what, what we're seeing has been so proven in the mainstream scientific community that the food does matter, the health of the gut does matter. But it's... Um, it's just such a delight to meet these folks and to um, really be a part of what I consider really important work. So thanks for bringing them up.